Chapter 8 The Wolf Planet I'm grateful you took the time to come, Derek said. He glanced at his companion sitting next to him in the runabout. Wouldn't have, except you sounded urgent, Wolrev said. They were heading east on Main Street toward Derek's apartment. He had just picked up Wolrev at the Wolf Planet's primitive spaceport at the west edge of the robot city. Wolrev had arrived in Zerabordiels, a Minneapolis-class hyperspace jumper that the wealthy Ariel had given the small alien the year before to speed her return home. The Zerabordiels could accompany ten accommodate ten passengers, and, as it turned out, it was the only way that Derek and his robotic companions were going to get off the planet. He had accidentally dis demolished his means of transport when he arrived. Wolfruff was the size of a large dog with sleek, well-groomed brown and gold fur, and she was shaped like a dog, except for the fat-fingered hands and the flat face which, despite its flatness, bore unmistakable lupine characteristics. Farther east on Main Street, a half kilometer beyond Derek's apartment, a large pyramidal edifice, the Compass Tower, was at that moment strikingly displaced in a glowing frame, red shafted by the morning sun still hidden behind it. You mean Ariel, Derek said. I sent my call for help through Ariel. You signed it, not Ariel. Wouldn't have come if you hadn't signed it. Situation desperate, Derek. Going to call you desperate, Derek, from now on. She gave a funny, gargling bark, not a growl, more a sharp, rattling gargle, as though her throat were laden with phlegm. Derek had become so accustomed to her in times past, he had forgotten that extraordinary chuckle and her uncommon treatment of galactic standard. The imperfections in her pronunciation of standard had regressed somewhat during the past year on her home planet, but a rolling of the letter R had been almost entirely eliminated after prolonged exposure to Ariel and Derek, and that improvement seemed to still largely be in place, except for a trailing burr. The left out and chopped off pronouns, the missing attishes, and the sibilant hiss for the Z sound were still evident, and the U pronunciation of U, not at all an O sound, but more of a choked and swallowed bark that masked off the initial Y could only come from the throat of a lupine alien, something a human was unlikely ever to match. I'd never labeled this situation desperate, Derek said. That's not the message I sent. I contacted Robot City on my internal monitor link, then they hyperwaved our house computer on Aurora. At least that's the routing I set up. I expected Ariel to replay my message to you, but that doesn't sound like Ariel either. It sounds more like someone with a vital interest in this planet, which is nobody I know of. Doesn't matter how I heard you. You succeeded. I'm here. Now what's so desperate you've got to call half across the galaxy? I've got a rogue robot on my hands, Wolrath. Doesn't follow the laws of robotics? Yes and no. It's got the laws but it doesn't seem to know for sure what a human is. It's like a darn chameleon. The way I've got it figured, it changes itself to match as best as it can whoever it thinks might be human at the moment. Like Mandelbrot's arm? Yes and no. The stuff it's made of isn't as coarse as the robot city material. Its cells are a lot smaller than the variety in Mandelbrot's arm. I've got, I've got a feeling we're seeing micromolecular robotics here. And I've got no way to program it. It's self-programmed and seems to imprint like a newly hatched chicken at the drop of a hat, and on anything it takes its mind to. So how can I help? Wolrof asked. It had a wolf form when I first arrived. It was the leader of a pack of intelligent wolf-like creatures, which it must have thought were human. They were attacking the city's Avery robots. The wolf robot gutted one of the Averys. The robot city relayed their call for help over my internal monitor. When I got here, it imprinted on me. After giving me a really hard time, and I mean a really hard time. It was still humanoid when I left it this morning, and soaking up information from the city library like a second-generation settler on a mission to Earth. What is it you think I can do? Bullruff asked. It was wolf-like when it came into the city after I arrived, and then it imprinted on me. 
Now it's coming along a little too fast. Too much personality change too quickly. With your wolfish characteristics, you make a natural model for imprinting. A nice compromise between wolves and humans. Amazing! Why do you humans persist in thinking of us as wolves? There's a species on my world, the Dongi Daos. They're a great deal like the gorillas in your zoos. But I don't think of you. Now, wait a minute, I take that back. You are beginning to resemble a Dongi Daogo a great deal. She gave that fledgem rattling gargle again. And yes, the trailing burr was still definitely part of the pattern. You can choke all you want, Wolrath. But I don't regard the situation as very humorous. Derek was not in the best of spirits. It was good to see Woolruff again, and that had cheered him momentarily. They had known each other for a long time, ever since she had been more or less a slave, an indentured servant, of the alien pirate Aranus. Derek had freed her with the help of Mandelbrot, the robot he had put together from the pirate's supply of spare parts. But Woolruff was hardly a stand-in for Ariel. Just seeing a good friend like Woolruff made him yearn for Ariel even more. If it had just been her and not Woolruff who had run down the ramp of the Zerborodizes, life wouldn't seem so grim right now. He shouldn't have reacted rever reversely to Woolruff's weak attempt at humor. He should at least give her credit for trying. But he missed Ariel, and he wasn't about to let anything cheer him up. You are in a foul mood, Woolruff said. A rogue robot couldn't make you feel that bad. Why isn't Ariel with you? It was eerie the way Wolrof could sense his mood, interpret it, and put her finger on what was bothering him. Uh, let's not get into that. Let's just say she wasn't too pleased with me when I left her in Aurora. So she's probably pouting back there in a snit. And then he added as a bitter afterthought for Playboy Winterson. He never met him, Jacob Winterson. Revolting... Well, it's revolting a bundle of stimulated muscle you'll ever see. A cyborg? Like Leong? Wolrof was referring to Jeff Leong, a young man whose brain had spent a rather unpleasant period in a mechanical robot body, while the Avery robots in Robot City had repaired and healed his damaged human body. No, a human form robot, Derek said. Looks exactly like a human, almost impossible to tell from the real thing. You are jealous of a robot? Wolrof gave that Fletchum gargle again. Wolrof said nothing. The conversation was veering in an unpleasant direction. Ah, a sore point, Wolrof said. My apologies. We're here, Derek said as he pulled the runabout to the curb in front of the apartment. He looked up anxiously to the second floor. You are expecting trouble? Wolrof said. She was reading his mind again. No, Mandelbrot would have phoned me, Derek said, not quite truthfully, for he did feel just a shade anxious as he got out of the small vehicle. Mandelbrot and Silverside didn't seem to understand one another. Perhaps he should not have let a robot to babysit another robot. But everything seemed normal when they walked into the small two-bedroom apartment on the second floor. Mandelbrot was standing in a storage niche in the wall near the door. Silverside was plugged into Derek's terminal, and didn't even turn around when they came in. Impressive, Woolruff said, her eyes going wide as she stared at the robot at the terminal. He's certainly got your scrawny shape. Silverside's lustrous, silvery exterior only approximated the details of Derek's appearance. But in size and proportions, it was, indeed, an excellent approximation. Woolruff was exaggerating, of course. Derek was not scrawny. He was thin, but well endowed with sinewy biceps and with hard plates of muscle, muscle across chest and abdomen, typical of an older teen's torso. But with that humorous barb, Woolruff had hit that sensitive nerve again. Derek did feel inadequate whenever he thought of Jacob Winterson. Everything under control, Mandelblot? Derek asked. He had walked to the center of the room hesitated when Silverside did not respond to their entrance, and then turned to address Mandelbrot. He got no answer from the robot in the niche. Mandelbrot? he repeated. Oh, yes, Master Derek. <clears throat> Silverside unplugged and turned to face them. Everything is under control. 
and Derek glanced at Silverside and then turned to walk toward the niche when he said again, Mandelbrot, you okay? He's fine, Silverside said. I deactivated him. You what? Derek's voice reflected his astonishment that Silverside would have had the term temerity to shut down Mandelbrot's microfusion reactor, risking partial loss of post-traumatic memory. When you're not around, he tends to give me unwanted advice, Silverside explained. Yeah, I'll bring him back up, since it apparently displeases you to have him down. It's a lot more than displease me, Derek's voice shook with anger. Stand back, I'll reactivate him myself. Silverside stopped. He had even started walking toward Mandelbrot's niche. And don't you ever, I repeat, and now Derek's voice was strident and grating, don't you ever deactivate Mandelbrot again. Certainly not, Silverside said, if that is your wish, Master Derek. That is certainly my wish. Very well, Master Derek. Derek had walked to the niche, and now reached around to swing open a plate set flush in Mandelbrot's back that covered a switch panel. Carefully, watching for Mandelbrot's reactions at each step, he reactivated the robot by flicking switches in a definite sequence. Stabilizing the microfusion reactor was the most delicate part of the activation procedure and took the most time. Almost half an hour. The robot's eyes were designed to guide that operation, changing color in the spectral sequence whenever it was safe to move on to the next phase from black through purple, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, and finally black to back to colorless black, Mendelbrot's switch-induced standby state. Completely ignoring Woolruff, Silverside had gone back to the terminal and plugged himself in again after his exchange of Derek. Woolruff had curled up on the Davenport and was fast asleep when Derek finished. Battery backup should have provided the low power needed to protect Mendelbrot's post brain from serious harm but there was always the possibility of a loss of long-term memory during the nanoseconds required to affect the switch from one power source to the other. Derek would never know until the gap revealed itself, perhaps at some juncture when that particular memory would be urgently needed. As he pressed the power reset button, he cursed himself for having left the two robots alone together. Mandelbrot's eyes lit up with a red glow that pulsed rhythmically. "'How do you feel now, Mandelbrot?' Derek asked. Normal. The wild one deactivated me. I didn't realize what he was doing until too late. The robot gave a small shudder. Was that a third law reaction just now? Derek asked. I believe so, Master. I didn't protect myself properly as the third law di directs. I felt a momentary disturbance upon reaching that conclusion, which must have sent an associated potential wave through my motor control system. Is that the way it appeared? Yes, I just wanted to be sure that it was not some damage from the activation, Derek said. Ah, Woolruff, you're awake. Woolruff yawned and stretched. Mandelbrot okay? It would appear so, except for a normal third law reaction, Derek replied. It looks as though another imprinting might not be as likely as you had thought, Woolruff observed. The small hairy alien was looking at Silverside, who was hunched over the terminal, and seemingly absorbed in the information that was flowing into his brain. Silverside is apparently pretty down as an inferior, Derek replied, a variation of this pl planet's wolf species. That was my conclusion, Silverside said as he unplugged and swung around in the swivel chair to face them. I have been unable to find any Woolruff biographical file or anything to contradict that conclusion. "'Would you tell me about yourself, Mistress Woolruff?' Silverside requested. "'No,' Derek said empathetically. "'Not now. Plug back into the library. The rest of us have got some things we must take care of now.' Silverside turned back to the terminal, and Derek motioned for the other two to follow him outside. When they were standing by the runabout at street level, Derek explained. "'As I suggested to you earlier, Woolruff, he's coming along too fast now.' Deactivating Mandelbrot confirmed that in my mind. I consider that a violation of a sort of corollary to the third law. How does a robot view that, Mandelbrot? The laws are not infinitely rigid, 
Mendelbrot said. They are surrounded by side potentials that create what I can only call soft boundaries, foothill potentials that lead to the ultimate peak. The first law has the hardest and sh sharpest boundaries of all, but even so those boundaries are not absolute and infinitely sharp. Are you saying he violated the third law? Derek asked. No, but he did something I would never do except to protect myself, a human or myself. Maybe he was protecting himself from your ideas, Mandelbrot, Borov said. Not likely, Mandelbrot said. I do not consider words and ideas to be a source of injury to a robot. But he is in a very sensitive and impressionable state right now, Derek said. And that's another reason I want to get him out of the city and back to the forest where I found him, where he's apt to be more comfortable and less perturbed by strange stimuli. We'll take the runabout to the east exit and walk the rest of the way. It's only a couple of miles to the place I have in mind. There's a small grassy clearing in the forest near a clear pebbly brook. It's very peaceful and quiet. You and the wild one can trot along behind until we get to the east exit, Mandelbrot. Then we'll all walk. Very well, Master Derek. Shall I get the tent and other survival gear from the storage locker? Yes. Derek could not remember his childhood. He knew that somehow it must have been different from that of other children in Aurora, for he did not have the natural e feel and easy, confident way of handling robots that was so much a part of a normal spacer's personality. Something acquired beginning in earliest childhood. In all the nurseries and homes, robots were the only nannies to be found. On Aurora, for instance, the closest any adult ever got to a child was the human who supervised the nursery nannies. Had he been raised by a human nanny, maybe even his own mother? Had that been a still earlier experiment of his eccentric father, Dr. Avery? Derek knew an intimate technical detail how robots worked. He was an expert roboticist. But he did not have that natural insight into the postronic brain that almost all Auroran children had by the age of five. The only robot Derek felt relatively close to is Mandelbrot. It wasn't a matter of trust or distrust. Robots were what they were programmed to be. You could trust even the Avery robots that built Robot City, and the other robot cities like the one here on the Wolf Planet, if you knew who at last worked with their insides. The only time you couldn't trust them was when someone like the irrational Dr. Avery deliberately altered their programming. He had, for instance, excluded Woolruff from protection when he revised the, pre the programming of the Robot City robots. But Derek seemed to lack the upbringing to deal naturally with robots, Mendelbrot being a possible exception, or as much of an exception as to make it a rule. And now he was confronted with Silverside. A being yet concluded from behavior and appearance must be a robot, yet a robot as unpredictable and unsettling as any he had ever dealt with. Like the Avery robots and like Mandelbrot's control of his arm, Silverside had the ability to change shape by changing the orientation of his cells, which themselves appeared to be tiny robots, microbots, even smaller than the cells of Avery material. Derek had pretty well established that those microbots during a metamorphosis which were re being reprogrammed by Silverside's postronic brain, much like some living organisms, lizards and amphibians, seemed to reprogram their own cells to grow a new limb or tail. Yes, he was quite uncomfortable with Silverside, and as he went around gathering up supplies for their outing, he realized, for the first time, that he had begun to consider Silverside actually dangerous. He had never felt that way about a robot before, not on Aurora or anywhere else. The fact that Mandelbrot's remark to distracted Silverside and reduced his efficiency did not seem to be a reasonable cause, logically arrived at, for the quite serious offense of deactivating another robot. Robots could not go around knocking one another out, seriously risking amnesia in the victim, simply because the victim had been a source of distraction, no more than people could. Silverside had done something Mandelbrot would never do, to use Mandelbrot's own words. Silverside was an alarming phenomenon, yet exceedingly fascinating. Derek knew the robot should probably be deactivated, but that was a step Derek could no more take than could many other scientists who were on the cutting edge of their disciplines and involved in experiments dangerous to the society they lived in.